webinar. I'm Noor Kokiar, and I'm the head or the executive director of the Washington State China Relations Council. Um, as you all know, we're a week away from the national election. I hope all of you have deposited your ballots in a secure drop box or you mailed them in a long time ago. Um, for those of you on the call that don't live in Washington State, and I, I must admit that I moved here about four years ago, I'm very impressed on how they manage elections here uh, in the state. Um, we get our booklet probably two, three weeks in advance of the election. We get the ballot two, three weeks in advance of the election. We get a chance to uh, study the candidates and the referendum issues, et cetera, uh, mark our ballot in, in the comfort of our own living room and then either drop it off at a, a, a drop box or mail it in. So it's really quite efficient. So I hope all of you have had a chance um, to cast your vote. So many pundits are calling this election a referendum on President Trump's performance in office, and in particularly his handling of the economy. A large part of his economic program was that he was gonna to get tough on China and he would fix the trade deficit. So today I wanna to call upon our speakers to kind of give us a report card on his handling of China and to bring us up to date on the phase one trade deal. I'd like to know has the trade deficit with China really decreased? And, have US, and how have US companies responded to the tariffs and pressures applied to them? I wanna know if we're gonna ex experience reshoring, and of course, are we gonna decouple the two economies? So I'm gonna ask both of our speakers to give us their thoughts, uh, but then when they finish their kind of formal presentations, I want them to comment or pretend that they have a briefing for the new occupant or the current occupant of the Oval Office when he sits down to work on January 2021. What policies or actions might be put in place to create a more equitable and balanced trading relationship with China? And of course, before I get started, I'd like to briefly introduce you to the Washington State China Relations uh, uh, Council. Uh, we are dedicated to developing and improving relations between Washington and China. We're the oldest state level organization of its kind, founded in 1979. Uh, we have a membership consisting of business, government, cultural, and educational entities, as well as individuals with an interest in China. Our activities include producing educational programs, manning delegations from China, consulting with state and local governments on their interactions with Chinese entities, and of course, working with the local Chinese community here in Washington State. Like today, we, we produce or co-produce webinars on topics of interest to our members. We've got several webinars coming up in the next couple of weeks and a special event or two. So please um, go to our website, which is www.wscrc.org uh, and see what's coming up on our event calendar. And lastly, I'd like to mention that our 41 year old model of relying totally on memberships to fund our operation is really not sustainable. With the slowing of the trade and investment relationship with China, WSCRC's membership has decreased. We'd like to ask those of you that are not members to support us through donating to our sister organization, the Washington State China Relations Fund, which can issue tax deductible receipts for any contribu contributions received. Details of how to donate are on our website. And now to introduce today's speakers. Uh, most of you, I think, or many of you that participated in the past are familiar with Dr. Spencer Cohen, a professional economics consultant based here in Seattle. He's a recognized expert on US-China economic relations, trade issues, and China's economic growth model. He's a frequent public speaker on US-China trade, the China's Belt and Road Initiative, and regional economic issues. Um, he has written extensively on the US-China trade war and the impacts on, on both our state and regional economies. Spencer is now the principal of a firm called High Peak Strategy and Analytics. Prior to this, from 2013 till just recently, he served as a senior economist with Seattle-based consulting firm. Previously, Spencer served as a senior policy advisor for the Washington Economic Development Council, as a research manager with the Washington Department and the Washington State Department of Commerce. He has a PhD in economic uh, geography from, from the University of Washington. Our second speaker is Cameron Johnson, who spent over 20 years working in management positions in China. He's an adjunct professor at NYU Shanghai and drives the APAC consulting and, and advising initiatives at Tidal Wave Solutions, which is a staffing and consulting firm based in Shanghai. In previous roles in China, he has served as the Asia General Manager for a leading carbon fiber company, as well as the China Operations Manager for a global sourcing and risk management company. He's also spent some time with 
Microsoft. Um, Cameron and I were, uh, knew each other quite well when I was based in Shanghai, uh, primarily through the American Chamber of Commerce, where he's quite active. He served as the head of the Chamber's Aerospace Subcommittee for several years, and he's the vice chairman of the Chamber's Manufacturing Business Council. So, as, as in all these events, we'd ask you to please keep yourself on mute throughout the session. We encourage you to go to the chat box uh, to, to submit your questions as we go along. Uh, we will have audience Q&A time at the end. If you want to personally uh, ask your question, please note that in the chat box and we'll try and get you on the screen uh, so you can ask your question to speakers. We are recording today's event, so if you want to review it later or you want to recommend it to a friend, it will be available. And with that, uh, it's time to get started. So thank you all for signing on and participating. And Spencer, I'll turn it over to you. Cool, thank you, Nora. Let me uh, share my screen. Okay. Well, thank you everybody for the opportunity to talk today. Uh, I'm really pleased to uh, participate with my colleague, Cameron Johnson, and talk about the phase one deal and provide our perspective on the outlook on the US-China relationship going forward from a trade perspective and commerce perspective. So what I'd like to talk about today, what Cameron and I will talk about is, first of all, like how do we get here? Um, a little bit of a refresher on the trade war and some of the background history about how we got to this point. I'll also talk about the, the trade war and the phase one scorecard. So there were some very clear objectives that were stated um, that motivated the trade war, as well as some objectives and targets that were defined in the phase one deal that was signed in January on January 15th of, of this year. And then Cameron's gonna talk a bit about, from his perspective, what US companies are seeing in China in this relationship, and then we'll have a discussion. Before I go on, there are a few main uh, points that I hope become pretty salient throughout this conversation. So. Firstly, is that the trade war is not over. You know, a lot of people think that with the phase one trade deal, that was sort of a conclusion to the trade war. And it really wasn't. It effectively froze um, or put a pause in place on additional escalations of uh, punitive tariffs and retaliatory tariffs. The, those elevated tariffs on Chinese imports are still in place. China has made headway in reducing some tariffs because they did want, I do believe they genuinely wanted to try to meet the export targets or importation targets they agreed to uh, with the US. But the, the actual escalation of tariffs, especially on the US side, are still in place. And in fact, there have been recently an additional round of export controls and retaliatory export controls from the US and from China that have further complicated our trade relationship. And then, uh, you know, secondly, um, is that we, uh, looking forward, I do believe that, so in order to judge the trade, the phase one deal, there's a lot of noise. And it's really hard to, from a technical standpoint to call out or identify what impact the deal actually had. And that's because of some of the obvious things we know about with respect to the disruptions from COVID-19 um, and other sort of policy issues that have been um, happening around the world, but most, mostly COVID, that have really made it very difficult to discern what the specific impacts of the phase one deal have, have had. But I do believe that from the get-go, the deal was not really positioned to succeed. And the reason was because it's a bilateral trade agreement. And that's been the primary modus operandi for the Trump administration has to take a unilateral approach to dealing with trade issues with our trade partners as opposed to a multilateral approach. Um, a multilateral approach, I believe, is a much more effective approach and can um, bring about much more positive, constructive pressure on China through uh, working with our allies, um, working within trade pacts such as the um, now CPTPP, but originally the TPP, and other measures that involved um, unifying or working collaboratively with allies to apply constructive pressure. So the bilateral nature of the deal was um, really going to undermine its success to begin with, especially since trade um, in this day and age is a very multilateral activity. Um, this, many of the things that we purchase from China are ultimately simply are assembled in China, but are drawn from or based on components imported from other parts of the world. So just wanna, those are two main themes I hope to sort of um, really make important um, salient points throughout this talk. So firstly, the 
one of the big objectives of the trade deal, and there were there were a few, but whoops, one in particular was the idea that uh, the bilateral trade deficit is an unsustainable trade deficit and is eroding U.S. competitiveness. Now we can dispute, you know, and I, I firmly believe that bilateral trade deficits are not a, a very useful metric in the 21st century. They were more useful in a more mercantilist um, global economic order. But in this day and age, when we're talking about US-China trade relations, uh, bilateral trade deficits are not terribly useful. But putting that aside, one of the objectives was to reduce the bilateral trade deficit significantly with China. And it has reduced. Um, we have data through August year to date for uh, 2020. So what we're looking at here in this chart is just looking at the bilateral trade deficit um, apples to apples, so comparing over the same period going back to 2014. And in fact, the trade deficit as of August of 2020 has been the lowest through the first eight months of the year since 2011. So the deficit has in fact gone down. Um, but again, it's really hard to discern how much of that is because of the phase one deal and the impacts that those policies are having on that bilateral trade relation or trade balance versus a lot of these other sort of contextual factors and, and other factors around the globe, mostly having to do with COVID and disruption of global supply chains and inability to purchase many products. So that's been, um, and given the fact that we purchased many of our products from China and not the opposite direction, um, it's, it's a difficult to discern how much of this reduction deficit is because of the, the phase one deal itself. So a little background on the trade war, and I'm going to be very brief just as a refresher, just to get us up and get a, provide some context. So uh, there was a first, the Section 232 um, of the 1962 Trade Expansion Act was invoked to apply tariffs on steel and aluminum. And then uh, Section 301 of the Trade Act of 1974 was invoked, and that allowed the president to impose tariffs and other measures to quote unquote protect U.S. intellectual property from foreign government practices. So this was launched an investigation by the USTR based on Section 301 in August of 2017, and it concluded that China in March of 2018 had been unfairly requiring foreign firms to transfer IP and target industrial sectors. So this is a lot of having to do historically with indigenous innovation policy and pressure on US companies and other foreign companies to transfer IP as part of any sort of joint venture agreement. Then we then had the tit for tat um, tariff war um, war is a bit of a, a hyperbolic term here, but um, probably not apt. It's not a war per se, but um, that's the term we're using. So U.S. and China retaliatory tariffs. And then by December of 2019, uh, there were about tariffs on U.S. imports uh, from China or Chinese exports, Chinese imports to the US, into the U.S. Um, about $360 billion worth of goods were subject to retaliatory tariffs. That is, they were already subject to a tariff, but the tariff was es escalated. Um, as a punitive measure to, um, to uh, discourage people from purchasing Chinese products. Um, about 50, 60, 50, 58% of U.S. exports to China were also subject to special additional tariffs on the Chinese side, so hurting U.S. companies, uh, farmers, especially commodity producers, and other kinds of manufacturers. And the other, the other uh, challenge for U.S. companies was that while the average tariff applied to U.S. imports into China was about 20% by December, the rest of the world actually experienced a reduction in the average tariff per good. So the rest of the world faced about a 7% tariff on their products for similar products compared with 20% for the U.S. So it was eroding our competitiveness in China. The objectives of the war were, um, and I, I'm, I'm just paraphrasing and trying to distill out what were the key motivations and objectives, but essentially to rectify persisting and large trade deficits to protect intellectual property and trade secrets from theft or coercion, uh, course of transfer of IP. Uh, there was also the need for further opening of the Chinese economy. So um, China had agreed in principle to opening its economy since extension to the WTO in 2001, and there were still large areas that were not quite open yet. So continue to promote an expansion and opening of the economy. And then to reduce trade distorting domestic policies such as industrial subsidies and the managed exchange rate. The deal that was signed on January 15th included chapters on national property protections, tech transfer, uh, food and ag products, so reducing phytosanitary barriers to importation of U.S. products, U.S. food and ag products, um, financial services opening, although that was already underway, it was kind of a moot point at that point, at that point um, with opening of uh, greater financial services for U.S. companies to provide in China, 
There was the macroeconomic policy exchange rate matters and transparency chapter. Um, China has been in the process of widening the tradable ban for its exchange rate for quite some time. It was actually uh, in the process of defending its currency, not trying to devalue it um, at the time of this discussion of the, uh, uh, in late 2019. Expanding trade is what I'll mostly focus on today. So that is the managed trade component where the U.S. government um, kind of, you know, bucking our, our longstanding belief in free trade and, uh, you know, uh, free open trade globally um, or fair trade and relatively free trade instead took the position that we wanted to set targets for China to buy stuff from us, which is a, a new um, innovation in U.S. policy we've not seen before. The bilateral trade dispute resolution and the final provisions, which of course, as some of you may know, uh, included uh, a delay in the implementation of the deal if, if for due to natural disasters, um, which uh, no one at time anticipated would also would mean a pandemic. So the deal set out uh, some very ambitious targets as part of those, those uh, expanding trade goals. So over a two year period, the Chinese government agreed to purchase in a $200 billion in addition to the levels of goods and services purchased in 2017. So 2018, 2019 saw a reduction in trade because of the trade war. So they used 2017 as the baseline and to expand that trade um, by $200 billion over the 2017 baseline, broken out by manufacturing, ag, energy, and then services. Looking thus far now at how the US has done or how the deal is done, um, so overall, um, based on those increased incremental increases in uh, exports for two, based on 2017, the US had, was expected, the deal set out for the China to import $154 billion worth of US goods in total in 2020. So thus far as of, and this is only for goods, I'm not looking at services right now, um, but thus far the US has exported roughly about $50 billion worth of goods that fall, fell into the categories that were identified in the deal. So not every manufactured product or ag product or energy product was listed in the annex of the deal for inclusion for targeted growth increases or growth. Of those products, about they've reached about $50 billion. If we were in fact on, roughly speaking, if we were on track to meet the objectives of the deal, we would be at $103 billion at this point. Um, August 2020. So it's a difference of $55 billion. So clearly the deal thus far is way behind, or woefully behind, what would have been expected based on the targets. Looking at it um, just in a broader view, extending that out to the rest of 2020, again, an expectation that based on the deal, the target was $154.4 billion in exports among those identified products in the annex of the deal. And we're on target to roughly hit about 70 or so billion dollars. So literally a, about half, if not a little bit less than half in dollar value of what was stated in the phase one deal. So, and really um, barring some miracle, there's no way we're going to be hitting this target for 2020. Um, I don't see any, I don't see any scenario whereby we hit that target. It's just not, it's not feasible at this point. And some of the recent announcements by the Chinese government um, that they've, they've rolled out about purchases of U.S. goods have been mostly for commodities, and those commodities are just a dent in that amount. You know, we recently talked about a, a, an increase or announced purchase of corn um, that only yields about, I think, one plus billion dollars worth of, of new importation. So we're very far away from hitting this target. Looking at some of the products and how they've or how they performed during the phase one deal, again, these are the products, these are some of the products that were actually identified and included in the deal because some of the products were actually excluded. So soybeans, for instance, uh, in 2017, we exported about $12 billion. Uh, U.S. exported $12 billion to China. Um, if you compare August 2017 year to date to August 2020 year to date, we're down by about $2 billion. Um, other products have done okay. Cotton is okay, but it's still, I mean, soybeans is by far our biggest ag commodity export to China. So the direction of the deal and its success really depends on how we perform with respect to soybeans. Uh, in terms of manufactured products, uh, commercial aircraft, which is basically Boeing, uh, in 2017, uh, we exported $16 billion. If you look at the difference through from August year to date 2017 versus August 2020 year to date, we're down $7 billion. And we'll talk, I'll talk a bit about that in a few moments. 
and then motor vehicles are down, are down about $4 billion. Looking in aggregate across the key categories, um, again, these are some hypotheticals versus projections for the rest of 2020. So, uh, in terms of manufactured goods that were included in the trade one in the phase one trade deal, we're expected it was targeted about 98 billion dollars worth of exports from the U.S. to China of all kinds of manufactured goods included in the deal. Right now, we're on we're on roughly on on target to hit about or we're on a directionally to hit about um, about 50 billion dollars. So again, about half. With respect to ag products, um, the projection, hypothetical projection, um, this is cumulative now, we're looking at about, the goal was $33.4 billion. Um, you can see the uptick is a function of some of the seasonality in terms of purchases of ag products, but right now we're roughly on path to hit about less than $15 billion. So a third, or a little less than, a half, little less than half of what the target is. And energy is also woefully below what those targets would be. Now, one of the big stories that affects Washington State has been the reduction in orders of Boeing aircraft from China. So you can see that um, in 2015, there were 210 new orders of Boeing aircraft. Um, and of course, the vast majority of these aircraft are manufactured in Washington State. Um, that fell to 75 new orders in 2016, 29 in 2017, and there have been no new orders since then. So 2018, 2019, now 2020. Now, a lot of that is a function of other things happening. With, for instance, uh, you know, we know that the, um, obviously the 737 MAX, which is the best-selling plane Boeing has, and their primary, the primary aircraft they do sell in China has had lots of issues in the ground with the 737 MAX, so that's disrupted new orders as China's holding off to see, or Chinese Airlines to see when those, those planes will be ready to fly again and make new orders. Uh, there's also, uh, and there is a backlog still of 122 existing aircraft. Um, that will be delivered. Uh, aircraft were not included, or commercial aircraft, uh, Boeing aircraft were not included among China's retaliatory tariff list, but there has been a cessation of orders nonetheless uh, since, since 2018. Uh, China represents for the past 10 years about 8% of all Boeing aircraft orders, um, um, across all Boeing orders. There's about 28% of all orders are within the US, and China's the second biggest market at about 8%. However, Airbus has actually done pretty well over this period. So Airbus has um, over 300 new orders since 2017. So we are, there are concerns about market erosion. Uh, that being said, you know, as you can tell from this graph, there is a lot of fluctuation in the structure of aircraft purchases um, and replacement of fleets and so forth. So um, even though they're having new orders, that could change due to other structural or secular structural, structural issues in uh, airline fleets in China that could change. And we're already hearing some, some, some news about potential new orders. So lastly, before I, I hand over to Cameron, I do want to just, again, frame this in terms of, well, how much do we really, we've seen this big drop in, uh, or not, we've seen a drop in uh, exports, but also we're woefully below what, we, what the phase one tra trade deal had laid out. Um, now, you could argue that those targets were unreasonable to begin with, and I was one of those people that believed they were not reasonable, but um, there's a lot of other factors in play beyond the aggressive targets themselves and how likely they were to meet those targets under good circumstances or conditions. And certainly the global economy has, has been in a real rut because of the pandemic. And you can see, for instance, um, across you know, all of our markets, all of our leading export markets have really suffered for the most part from the pandemic. So, you know, our looking in the table on our left, these are our largest export markets for the US in 2019. So you know, our NAFTA partners, Canada and Mexico, are our largest export markets. Um, Canada, about $300 billion. Mexico, about $260 billion. And then China is our third biggest market overall for goods exports. And you can see that the adjustments, this is the, what I'm comparing here is that uh, what we're looking at is the October 2019 GDP forecast from the IMF. And comparing that against the October 2020 forecast, uh, that factors in the adjustment because of the sudden disruptions in the economy from COVID. And you can see the big reduction um, going from Canada from a, a 2% growth down to 7% contraction. Similarly for Mexico, and of course China saw, you know, is still in the positive, but went from a 6% growth projection for 2020 down to 2%. Um, we've also seen trade overall globally as part of that contract considerably um, in 2020. So. In Q2, we've seen about 14% contraction in trade quarter for quarter. 
and so North American, mostly U.S. exports, are down 25%. Um, so, you know, again, the phase one deal um, had its own structural challenges, beginning with the fact it was bilateral and it set, I believe, some, some pretty unreasonable targets. But it was also kind of a maelstrom of just um, unanticipated events, primarily COVID, that really made it far more complicated to reach those targets. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague Cameron now to talk about what's happening in perspectives on the trade one, the trade relationship from Shanghai to China. Uh, thanks, Spencer, and hello, everyone. Um, thanks for joining, particularly those of us in Asia who got up early this morning and appreciate your support. Um, yeah, a lot of the trends going on at the moment is uh, manufacturing. Um, part of the reason for the trade war was to bring manufacturing back to the U.S. Um, and even as it evolved to, how should we say, more friendly areas. Uh, and this really has not happened uh, as many thought. Uh, for example, BMW is actually doubling down in China. Uh, roughly 30% of their revenue globally is in China, whereas 15% is in Germany. Coke as well is planning to uh, invest uh, several billion dollars in expanding capacity here. Uh, they're not really doing that anywhere else. Um, business investment in China is slowing. Uh, the FDI is slowing, but generally it's not slowing because operations are maturing. Um, it's still a first priority for roughly 20% of uh, foreign businesses in the uh, in the world and it's a second or third priority for another half so we're still seeing significant investment um, although not what it was you know, 10 years ago um, some of the industries that are seeing the heaviest investment are those related to supply chains and food uh, transportation and logistics specifically um, we've all seen uh, the pictures of the you know delivery guys on little scooters that are running around everywhere um, we're going to see extensive investment in new delivery formats uh, both for food um, you know purchasing things off of alibaba or you know amazon uh, and so on retailers uh, we've seen have had a bit of a pullback they are not investing as they were previously uh, some of that has to do just with how COVID has affected businesses in general uh, others because they're taking more of an e-commerce online platform uh, focus. Um, some of the companies uh, or some of the reasons why um, companies are increasing investment is because of the growth potential of the China market. It is still, particularly for many industries, the biggest growth area in any industry um, or most industries. Uh, for example, um, anything related to technology, of course, we see BMW, um, luxury goods, uh, as well as uh, new products that are coming online that you know, may take a while in the U.S. or Europe, but are um, either for data analysis or bringing in uh, more testing capability are being done here on the mainland versus previously maybe in Silicon Valley. Um, and the other is there is a shift by some Chinese operations are moving overseas. It is limited so far, but they are going going into the Southeast Asia, there's been some movement into Mexico, um, US, but that has essentially died down the last two years. Um, so those are just a few of the uh, manufacturing trends overall that are happening. Spencer, next slide, please. So <clears throat> business, the mood on the ground in general is, uh, particularly in foreign businesses, is we're all getting a little tired at this point after several years of having this tension. Um, it is no longer just a tension on the business front. It has also spilled over into geopolitics, you know, political, cultural. Um, it's becoming more challenging in general. Um, tariffs did have an initial impact a couple years ago when they first were started and were ramped up, but now generally it's muted. Uh, when you talk to most businesses today, they, they either have an exemption or they're just passing the cost on to the consumer. Um, but it has almost no difference in businesses changing the energy or moving, or moving operations back to the U.S. Manufacturing in general, though, is one of the areas of the economy in China that is struggling. Um, in the major cities at the moment, if you're in a Shanghai, a Beijing, a Chongqing, a Shenzhen, 
Your business probably is okay. Uh, we're at about 95% normal. Disneyland is open, although it, its numbers are severely restricted. Uh, temperature checks are mandatory, you know, when you enter most buildings or the subway. Um, but generally, we're free to roam. You know, we have lunch and dinner outside uh, without masks and so on. Um, but manufacturing, uh, once you start getting beyond the larger um, areas such as the Yangtze Delta or, you know, down around Guangdong is struggling. This is an area we see that the government is putting a little bit more focus and support on just because of the amount of workers and also the businesses that are tied up in it. Um, investment is now focused primarily on an in China for China strategy, um, as we just discussed, BMW and Coke are doubling down. Uh, despite the trade war, as of 2019, 78% of U.S. companies reported profitability, which you would think would be different given the current situation. Um, businesses, if they are moving manufacturing or supply chains, are generally going to Southeast Asia and Mexico, and I think on the next slide we'll have something about that. There is a large discussion by most countries, and that includes the U.S., uh, most major countries in the European Union, Japan, Korea, um, even Taiwan, Vietnam, Australia, about bringing home, quote unquote, essential goods. That would be anything related to pharmaceuticals, uh, high level uh, materials, um, rare earth uh, processing, semiconductors, just to begin, um, just to name a few. And the other is there is almost, there is expected to be serious national security reviews of every major industry. Um, by most Western governments in the next few years, uh, whether that's related to being only China's focused or centric, or just ensuring that if there is a disruption in the supply chain, that it's actually, you know, there is another option than perhaps a more friendlier um, country. Spencer. So this is from a survey done by the American Chamber of Commerce in Shanghai, and was released last month. 71% uh, of companies said they're not shifting anything out of China. 14% uh, were moving to some production to non-US locations, Southeast Asia and Mexico being the primary two. Only 4% are moving anything back to the US. So one of the things to keep in mind is manufacturing, as we know, it will never return to the US. And this is something that is uh, uh, becoming clear again and again and again. This 4% has fluctuated between 4 to 6% for almost the last decade of the AmCham Shanghai surveys. Um, supply chains are diversifying, but what we're seeing is China is essentially becoming a hub, and you will have a uh, Mexico and Vietnam and Central America, you know, uh, somewhere else in Central America, maybe a Thailand, maybe Malaysia, maybe somewhere in Eastern Europe but you will still have a primary hub in China simply because uh, the ecosystems exist here and not most other places. And as we discussed earlier, 71% are not changing any investment whatsoever. So what we see from the trade war really is an entrenchment of businesses in China for China uh, and not uh, going with what the uh, US hope was of returning that capacity back to the US. Just a few other random stats. Um, the trade deficit now is at the same as it was in the beginning of the Trump administration. <laughs> so it didn't, it, you know, it, I'll leave it to you to decide whether it was effective or not. Um, reshoring of US uh, factory production, job, job growth and production both peaked in 2018. Uh, both AmCham China and AmCham Shanghai Chamber surveys suggest there really is no movement whatsoever other than just a few percentage points. And until March, there were many products that were heavily levied, uh, most in the 25% tariff range for PPE. And even to this day, there are still some PPE, such as x-ray equipment, thermometers, just to name a few, that are still tariffed going into the US despite having this pandemic. And then kind of last is, you know, we're often asked, what are the challenges? IP is still a challenge. Enforcement is a concern, but there's been significant progress the last, uh, I would say probably since 2015, 2016. There are now independent IP courts 
in most major cities on the eastern seaboard, so that would be Beijing, Shanghai, uh, Guangzhou, and Shenzhen. Uh, these are not part of the regular court system. They are specifically and only for IP protection uh, and, I, and IP concerns. 54% uh, of uh, foreign firms have said this is a hindrance um, and there, has, there was significant difficulty obtaining license, whether it was patenting, trademark, uh, but it's actually down from the previous year. So we're seeing some improvement, um, but we'll have to see what after 2020 what the new survey says, if it's a trend or if this was just a one-off. Uh, business travel is extremely challenging into China and actually Eastern Asia. Uh, within China, there is uh, flexibility. I myself have traveled to uh, several cities for work. Um, you know, you have to have your special code to get on the plane, you wear masks, your, your temperature is taken, but generally you're free to go about the country. One of the biggest challenges at the moment for firms is are still stuck outside of China and unable to get in. This is particularly true for those of us who were on business visas, uh, you know, who would come in maybe for a few weeks, a couple times a year. Uh, that business and travel is not allowed. The only people who can come in are Chinese nationals, are those who have either a recently expired or still valid residence permit. Force majeure is becoming more uh, prevalent, uh, particularly in manufacturing. Uh, most companies are under extreme strain. Um, in the spring, it was because there was a lack of uh, factory openings. Companies still generally had to pay, pay employees some form of salary and benefits. Uh, now it's because more companies and customers outside of China are having great financial strain, particularly from the U.S. and Europe, so they're unable to pay for goods or products. Um, and tensions now have spread, as we can see, to other countries, not only the U.S. So the general business is becoming more complicated within not only Asia, but globally, just because there's more tensions going on um, between all kinds of countries and over all kinds. That's all I had. Spencer? Cool, okay. Maybe, maybe Spencer, I'll jump in here. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, we don't have uh, questions coming in the chat box, so folks, please, uh, please send in your questions. I wanna ask a question right off the bat before uh, uh, we uh, take your, quest, your issue about what the administration consider. What about the trade and services? I mean, the US had a, uh, positive balance of trade in balance of trade and services, um, mm -hmm. but now with not as many students showing up, Chinese tourists not coming like they used to, Chinese investors not coming. How's how's that look today? Do we know? So the latest data. So we don't have so services data is a lot harder to track, um, and there's a bit of a lag. So we don't have the same level of data resolution um, with respect to services yet to see how they've performed um, with respect to the phase one deal. But I, I think per your points, I agree with your points more that, you know, we run it, we, you know, if you just isolate for services, we do run it a, a, a surplus for services. Um, those services come in a whole suite of different types of, of offerings. So as you mentioned, uh, tourism is a big part of that. So anytime a foreign national, like a Chinese national, travels to the US and spends money, that's, a, that's technically an export, even though that transaction is occurring in the US. Um, that's still the nexus point. Uh, there's also students you know, paying for tuition, but there's been a lot of stigma, stigmatizing, unfortunately, of uh, Chinese students. Um, we've seen that, and some of them might be more you know, sensationalized, like specific stories than within the, the full sort of like scope of what's happening per se, but it's definitely happening. I think that where people are a little hesitant or, or refraining from coming here potentially on the margins, um, as well as simply because of COVID, of course, people can't travel, which is the biggest issue. But then there's also royalties, so software royalties, companies like Microsoft, for example, um, whenever they sell uh, licensing, you know, they, they lease out, you know, licensing for their technology, for their software, that's, that's a service as well, service export. So, um, we have a strong advantage in services, especially on the tech side, but um, as you mentioned, a lot of it is likely going to have a big drop just because of COVID um, and people's inability to physically travel here for study or for, or for tourism. 
And on, on, and before we go to the next part, there is a question or a comment from uh, Jerry Strube, who said he was involved in environmental and clean tech business in China, which was a very fast growth market. And I, I would guess much of that was in service. Um, and do we, do we still have a lot of exports? Do we still know if US companies are very active in China in that area? I don't know if either Cameron or Spencer can respond to that one. I, Cameron, you go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the, you know, the, the, for the clean tech, I mean, the most obvious one is Tesla. You know, Tesla has a massive factory here that they will start to begin actually exporting cars uh, to other places outside of China. So that's one. Um, the ecosystems for clean energy, clean technology in China are unlike anything anywhere else in the world. It doesn't matter if you're in uh, wind energy, tidal energy, uh, particularly electrical vehicles, um, you know, that ecosystem is um, unparalleled anywhere in the world. So we're seeing extensive um, leaps in technology and capacity uh, with Chinese companies in that area. So this, this is one focus um, where you will start to see Chinese innovation affecting the rest of the world, particularly in the automotive EV sector in the next couple of years. Great. Thanks, Cameron. So let, let's move on to the, the big question. So it's January uh, 20, 2021. Um, either President Trump or President Biden is now settling in the Oval Office. What advice would you give to the, whoever's in that chair um, on how we should try and repair or improve our relationship, trading relationship with China? So Spencer, you got some ideas on that one? I'll start, yeah. So, so I think that, um, there, there should be at least any any trade policy with China should be animated by at least four basic principles. And there could be more than four, but I think for starters, there should be four that should motivate the design and application of any uh, China trade policy. And so first and foremost should be do no harm, right? So when you engage in a trade war or tariff war, what do you want, whatever you want to call it, um, you know, tariffs are taxes. And so we've seen that the trade war has created more damage, economic damage, arguably to the US in the short run than it has to China. Um, we've seen that with the cost burden or the burden that's borne by, by households. There have been numerous estimates that have shown upwards of $1,000 a year per household um, if the trade war continues um, in terms of, uh, because they are absorbing those costs, many importers for consumer goods are oftentimes passing down those costs to end, end consumers. So you're hurting households because they're paying more for goods that don't really have a good substitute. They don't, it's not like you can switch your purchase of, of a textile product manufactured to China in China to a U.S. producer, or some other producer. So that's the first one is do no harm. And that also applies to um, our supply chains. A lot of manufacturers rely upon um, or rely upon Chinese imported goods and there's no perfect or, or immediate substitute replacement for those key inputs that they need for their their advanced manufacturing technologies and similarly again you know with farmers for instance and other exporters in the China when you engage in a trade war it's both ways so those companies such as commodity producers who have invested years upon years trying to grow market share in China um, can lose it very quickly um, and lose that investment if they're cut out or they're shut out because of very high tariffs and they're not able to compete and you have other competitors come in. We've seen that a little bit in, in wheat, for instance, um, or at least their concerns about wheat, where you have Siberian, Australian wheat, Canadian wheat potentially coming in and undermining U.S. wheat in certain applications. So that's the first principle is do no harm. The second principle is reciprocity. So if you have it, so you should have a clear um, vision for what it is you're trying to accomplish with respect to trade policy, right? It cannot be knee jerk. It cannot be impulsive. It has to be coherent. And part of that coherence is having a clear vision of like what, if you want to have, you know, you should, if we want to have greater access um, if, if we're going to let, you know, we should say, if we're going to let Chinese, if we're letting Chinese companies, which we are, into the US economy and the US market, then we should demand at least a similar access in the Chinese economy, in the Chinese market. We should frame 
the way that we negotiate based on that principle of reciprocity. And that's, that is a really important principle that is not always explicit in negotiations. It's often lost in broader issues of, you know, national security and so forth. But I think while those are important, reciprocity in market access is really important. The third is, uh, as I mentioned before, is multilateralism. Trade is not a bilateral activity. Trade deficits at a bilateral level are not useful metrics anymore. Uh, we look at all the things we import from China, vast majority are final assemblies in China, but imported from other countries. Uh, likewise, uh, you know, we get a lot more done if we work with allies to apply constructive pressure. Now, that doesn't mean there are institutions that have not worked the way we hope to, right? Like the WTO, which is not able to even reach a quorum right now in large part because the, because the Trump administration will not allow for a uh, nomination of new appellate judges. But even setting that aside, the WTO was not really built to handle China, you know, and I think there were some misunderstandings or misbeliefs about what the WTO could accomplish or how China could fit within um, the rules of in, rules of participation and rules of, you know, global rules, rules of the, you know, global trade. So, you know, thinking it doesn't mean that we have to work with existing institutions, but we should have a multilateral approach that enlists the participation of our allies. And something like the, I mean, as much as it got ballyhooed and criticized um, in the 2016 election, the Trans-Pacific Partnership was a good direction to go. It was a good model. Um, and it was really, you know, it's basically the USMCA is effectively the TPP. You know, that's basically TPP for three countries instead of 12. So having that kind of multilateral approach is really important. That sets standards, that applies constructive pressure, and offers up to China if you want to be part of this trade pact, we're not going to punish you, but we're not going to let you in until you demonstrate that you've reformed and you've, per, you've demonstrated that you're willing to comply with and conform with our rules in this system. So I think that's a much more effective approach. And then lastly, you know, and I think Cameron could talk a lot about this based on his experience um, with PPEs, but national security. So setting all that aside, we should have a good understanding of what types of things do we not want to rely entirely for trade to acquire? You know, and um, we've seen, you know, with PPEs, is one example where we had a significant shortage in relying, relying upon China to import PPEs, you know, personal protection equipment. So having a strategy in advance that identifies what are those key nodes in supply chains that are so critical for U.S. national security that we have to do something at least to shore those up while still promoting open trade and still promoting, um, you know, a growth of trade along with China and other, other markets. So... Um, those are mine, and I would I, just as a, a, a overall overarching thing, which I, I found really frustrating with the trade war, has been the lack of coherency with the Trump's administration's trade policy. Um, so I'll stop there, but I'll turn it to Cameron for his thoughts. Yeah, do what the doctor ordered, right, Spencer? So um, I echo most of that. Um, I'd add also that you know this is 2020. What happened before is absolutely invalid moving forward. Uh, tariffs are a 19th century tool being used in the 21st century dynamic. It just simply does not work. It's not very. Is have new methods and ways, and that just takes time. I think what we're seeing generally now, nor to your point about you know being the president, you're starting to see some consensus. Uh, on both sides of the aisles and various establishment, we need some form of national security, you know, priority. Uh, for example, steel has become one. We need some form of, you know, pharmaceutical priority, you know, so at least we have access to something if, you know, resources are cut off. Um, I think there are things that are starting to coalesce, although I, it will take more time. I think the other thing is there is a large uh, battle, it seems, and this is just looking from afar from China, uh, currently between various U.S. establishments, the old guard, the new guard, you know, the the mode of, hey, bring China into the WTO and all will be well has been completely turned false. And so when those who are some of these delicate matters, they are basically brushed aside and said, what you said was false. You don't know what you're talking about. We need to go a different path. So I think if... I was in that position, I would really say there needs to be some kind of consensus uh, driven and some strategy that actually is for 2020 moving forward and not based off this strange dynamic of, you know, um, either the Cold War experience or just, you know, China's not like us. I just don't think in today's world, 
where the earth is but one country, mankind its citizens, to name a famous quote. It just doesn't work that well. The other thing is, I'm personally invested. I live in Shanghai. You know, kids go to school here. So if anything ever happened, I mean, you know, it took the U.S. A th over a month to airlift a thousand Americans out of Wuhan. There's 50 some odd thousand of us in Shanghai. You know, <laughs> it's not really realistic. You know, so I was like, what is your alternative? What is your real? Going back to this point about manufacturing, uh, the ecosystems just do not exist in the States as they do in China. And there's many reasons for that. Sometimes it's technology, sometimes it's government support, uh, sometimes it's raw materials. And so if there really is a plan to move in that direction, then it needs to be some real understanding of what that means. Um, and it means a lot of things. It means higher prices. It means governments will have to make commitments they don't want to make. Uh, um, it also means that supply chains will have to shift and a lot of businesses don't want that to shift because it's more profitable to be made here, for example, than it is other places. So those are just some areas off the top of my head um, to answer your question, Noah. Great, good, good, thanks. Let me, um, we've got a couple questions in the chat. Let me just throw one in uh, before I move to those. What about finance as, as phase one trade deal uh, the financial markets in China were supposed to be opened up, and quite frankly, they seem to be opening up. And uh, there's more and more money pouring into China. China represents a very small part of global capital flows. And uh, compared to the size of the economy, money will move to China. So what I'm seeing now is that, that many big U.S. financial firms are getting opportunities in China that they hadn't had before. And maybe in some ways, China's saying, hey, look, you know, here's, here's these companies will now... Uh, support my case in Washington and make, make it uh, su support the fact that China is getting more involved in the world economy. Any, any comments on that one, Spencer or, or Cameron? Well, I'll, go, I'll, I'll just speak briefly on this, but um, so I think that it's, it's good that, that they are opening up financial markets, but the skill, the opportunity feels a little limited just because China still has fairly stringent capital controls. And, you know, as much as China, in order for China to really become a, a thriving financial market, I think they have to, there's a lot more steps involved. Like they have to open up their capital market, their capital account. Um, they have to stop controlling their exchange rate or manipul you know, in, inter, 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 you know, interfering in their exchange rates, managing exchange rate. Um, so I think that, you know, and China talks a lot about its objectives to become, to make that rim and for instance, to internationalize it. But, I don't think China really wants to run large deficits that come part and parcel with becoming a reserve currency, or at least a reserve currency at the scale of the U.S. or even approaching the U.S. So I think it's good. I think it's an important development to open up markets to, to U.S. financial institutions. But I see a natural limit to how much growth there could be just because of the fact that they're not willing to take those more pain, you know, meaningful, I think, steps to open up their financial system more. Yeah, I, um, I'm a strong believer that the party wants to stay in control. And if they opened that up, uh, they would lose more control than they would like to. So I, I think that's yeah. the case. Right. Um, a couple of comments or a couple of questions. Uh, one gentleman asked uh, for Cameron, is business travel and the meeting culture changing in China? I think because of COVID-19, um, you know, the rest of us have all gone online. Has China changed at all or not? Um, the answer is yes and no. Um, business travel is less. People are doing more meetings online. Um, there is you know, less face-to-face, -face, but uh, what we see for deals, you know, a lot of my work is inspecting of supply chains and manufacturing factories. Um, you know, I still go physically go to the location. Um, we're involved in PPE, so we've done that extensively over the last six months. Um, so you don't really see that changing trend and I'll um, put it on a broader scope if you just look at the travel uh, that happened at the October holiday a few weeks ago it was almost on par with last year there was not very much I mean there was some dif differentiation people didn't go to certain places but you know Huangshan which is a mountain close to Shanghai I and mean, it was packed and it was a four-hour wait to get mm -hmm. off the mountain because there were so many people so travel is more or less domestically in China back to normal. Hmm. I did not go to the mountain, by the way. I just, no. <laughs> well, it, I, I have been to that mountain on occasion. You can walk down if you want. <laughs> so there is a way down. Right. Okay. Um, another question. Um, 
was with so many U.S. managers stranded abroad, do you think U.S. firms are, are struggling? Are they tough decision, are they having a hard time decision making, managing their businesses? Uh, some are. Um, my firm, uh, Tidal Wave, was involved in some of that uh, just because you know, we are also, along with consulting, we are a uh, recruitment staffing firm. Uh, what you're seeing, though, is a lot has moved online. Um, you are also seeing uh, more responsibility and scope given to local managers. Um, and you're also seeing those that are here, uh, man particularly, I would say, American foreign managers who are here without their families, because there has been a challenge, particularly until about mid to late September of getting families back in. Um, a lot of them, um, you know, their families have said, listen, you, if you're going to come back home, uh, meaning home country, you know, within a certain period of time, because we're just not, you know, the, when the kids get in school, right, you can't really move again for another year. Um, so we're starting to see some of those trends. So we will see another wave of another exodus of some foreign managers or talent just because they have, you know, they weren't able to get their families back in or there were other circumstances that are dictating them to leave. So, uh, but again, will they be replaced by, you know, foreign managers, U.S. managers? The chances are probably 50-50, whether they bring somebody new in, because again, once you come in, it's two-week quarantine, you have to get everything done again. Uh, it's very challenging at the moment to do that. And is that um, true of other foreign companies, other foreign nationals? Every, almost every major foreign country is, and you know, the Germans, the, the French, they all have similar uh, challenges as well. Okay. And uh, Carl, you had a, a comment about uh, Samsung had moved all their uh, manufacturing out of, out of China and, uh, into Vietnam, and as such, they've pretty well lost their market share. I'm not sure exactly what you, you want to switch on and make your comment there. Yes. Yeah, so, <clears throat> hello, everybody. So, actually, in 2015, I gave a presentation at Seattle University talking about the globalization of mobile technologies, uh, where I predicted Apple would shift its uh, production. Remember, all of these major Western companies depend on Taiwanese contract outsource manufacturing and, of course, TSMC, Taiwan Semiconductor Chip Manufacturing. These Western multinationals don't care about geopolitics. Well, they care, obviously, but they don't want to be involved in geopolitics between, the China, between China and the United States. So they, I believe they put in, plan, in place five years ago uh, an exit plan for how to get manufacturing, not, not, um, not retail, but manufacturing and IP out of China five years ago. And that's why you see it going into multiple places, India, Indonesia, and uh, and Western companies do, want, do not want to be held hostage by any country or company, including the United States. Uh, and in my humble opinion, the ultimate uh, race to the bottom is when the Chinese, the Japanese, the Koreans, the Americans, the Australians all recognize the big hungry market is actually the African continent. So right now it's Southeast Asia. I believe the ultimate destination, at least in my sector, in my industry, is the African continent. You can see it, it's clear, it's obvious. So uh, yes, Samsung has gone to Vietnam. They started doing that more than five years ago with their smart watches, uh, and eventually a year and a half ago with their smartphones. Apple, is n Apple depends on Foxconn and Pegatron for some of their smartphone manufacturing, but you will see even the Chinese companies like Xiaomi uh, and Huawei, depending on Foxconn, and they're taking them into uh, India. India is a huge market for smartphone manufacturing uh, and usage. Um, retail, my humble opinion is, no Western company should leave China for retail. But if you want to protect your IP and you don't want to be part of, uh, of geopolitical issues between any countries, you go to where opportunities are. And that's not China right now, obviously. Great. So uh, just a quick comment is um, I've tracked some of the exports out of Vietnam over the years. And you can really see once Samsung started ramp ramping up their production, the exports out of Vietnam really did, did rise. Can I, can I say something real quick, just to add on to that though? It's more of a, it's more of a question, but I'm curious like how, so we, there's a lot of talk, like the Samsung story is super interesting, um, but I do wonder, you know, there, there's a lot of talk about diversification of supply chains and 
you know, those companies like Carl, the, where you're just, where you mentioned about Samsung, and if they're just in China to, for manufacturing, it gives them more agility or flexibility to relocate. But whereas if you're like in China for China, right? But I wonder, and I've not seen this yet, but if there's a, they've how lost much, how much, how much or, or like how much capacity is there globally to absorb so what's in China for production only? And Good question. competitive with China, right? Because there's so much like last mile logistics that China's invested in that makes so, it difficult to so, so, place. So for Samsung, this is a very good question. Um, actually, I'm not sure if you guys know this, but Samsung has their own, they're the second largest semiconductor manufacturer in the world. People don't realize mm -hmm. that, but they can't sell their chips in China or North America because of Qualcomm. They cannot sell their Xinox chips in North America or China because of Qualcomm, which means they have very little sales now in China and their semiconductor business, they want to grow in a big way. They can sell those to India with their own chips and their own smartphones. Apple is the same, the same situation. So, um, or a little bit different situation. So when you think about why they're in a country and why they're going to another country, um, uh, they, it has a lot to do with if you have no sales in a country, if your sales are declining so dramatically, and then you still see IP leakage and IP theft, why are you there? Uh, that, that kind of, I hope that kind of explains it a little bit. I don't know. Why are you there if you're not, if you're not selling and right. your IP is being stolen? Why are you there? Right. Okay, let's, um, we, we got, we're, we're past five o'clock. We can take about five more minutes of questions. Um, Spencer, uh, uh, Gary asked, do you see the rise of ant affecting government's control of the financial sector? Because we were talking about the financial sector previ previously. Yeah. And I know Jack, Jack Ma's made some comments about the financial sector recently. So any comments on that? So I'm, I'm not an expert on, on Ant Financial, but I'll, I'll share what I know. Um, and I'm, I'm a, I don't think the government, for instance, would allow Ant Financial to grow to the size it is and to do the IPO, this $35 billion IPO, if they saw it as a legitimate threat to their control of the financial system. So that's my default assumption. And I could be proven wrong. I'm happy to prove wrong. But I, I think that they're... They see it as a as an out. And, and my understanding with Ant is that it like and, and someone else correct me about this. My understanding is Ant does not. They they're a platform, but still the vast majority of the lending is still through the China's traditional banking system. That's correct. They're, they're a platform for facilitating um, lending in a very expedient way, but the the money is still being sourced. The lending is still from the traditional banks. So, yeah. So you you can. Carl, right. a third-party payment platform. Oh, am I on mute? Yeah, you, we didn't pick up what you had to say there. Oh, can you hear me? Yes, now we're okay. So, Ant Financial is a third-party payment platform, but their third-party payment platform through still goes through China Union Pay and the Central Bank of China. They they work together. Uh, I was instrumental in bringing mobile payments contactless mobile NSC payments into China, 2008 until 2013. Ant Financial has been squashed to touch cryptocurrencies. They can't touch it. The government won't allow them. Ant Financial recognizes this, uh, and they don't want to go against the governments. And of course, Jack Ma, who knows where he keeps his money? I'm thinking little Caribbean islands. Anyway, the key point is they want to grow cross border payments because they're restricted inside China and they can't touch cryptocurrency number one and they can't really touch this new DCEP which you and I were chatting about because the Chinese government in my humble opinion doesn't 100% trust both Alipay and WeChat Pay because all they are is third-party payment platforms with a wallet. The, the M1 money reserve is still the Central Bank of China, uh, the Zhongyang Inhang, and uh, China Union Pay, which administers the technology. Ant Financial is a third party payment platform. Their servers go and must be, the security for their servers must be approved by China Union Pay. Hope that explains it a little bit more. That, yeah, that, that, that is quite helpful. <laughs> so, um, one, one last question we had. Um, 
what are positions for data centers and other energy intensive industries? And I guess Matthew, Matthew asked that question. Um, I guess our, uh, the question is, are data centers growing and energy intensive industries growing in China? I don't know, did uh, Spencer? Uh, data been... centers um, are a challenge, but they're, they're more focused on if they're for things like uh, Bitcoin or cryptocurrency. Um, if they're more, you know, supporting, um, you know, uh, Alibaba's cloud or something like that, it's it's not as challenging because you have to have that these days. But they, when they look at what is using energy, they're really looking into things like cryptocurrency. Um, and the other thing is they have challenges such as the U.S. does with just their infrastructure and the grid. Uh, some of it is new, particularly on the west or eastern seaboard. But once you start getting into the hinterland. You know, around Chongqing, Xi'an, a lot of that still is kind of the older, you know, yet to be replaced, you know, transmission lines um, and so on. So we're, we're starting to see some of that change. So at the moment, it really is, is focused on, you know, if you're doing uh, cryptocurrency, some kind of mining, uh, they'll knock you for that. But otherwise, if it's data centers or things related to new high level technologies, they usually don't mind as much. Good. Okay, well, we're, we're coming up at about 5.10 and one or two people have made comments that they have to sign off and, and say thank you. Um, I will just uh, comment that next week is, uh, is election week, so we're not going to run a program next week. I think uh, all the energy in the room is going to be consumed about watching the returns starting Tuesday night, so uh, we won't try and interfere with that. Our next event will be on the 10th of November, which is uh, a joint event we do. It's called a town hall with a national... the China, the U.S. National Committee on U.S.-China Relations. Um, and we'll have a uh, speech by Ray Dalio, the uh, head of Bridgewater Associates, who's, who's had a long uh, history of investing in China, knows a lot about China. So that should be quite interesting. And we'll follow that up with Spencer. We'll uh, lead a discussion of some of the key points of that, that presentation. So hopefully you can join us um, for that. And uh, look at our website, because we also got a, a two-day conference with SUP China that we have um, discounted memberships for, or discounted tickets for, if you'd like to participate, that's on the um, 11th and 12th. And then we're going to have an author of a book called The Myth of Chinese Capitalism, a guy called uh, Dexter Roberts, who was a Business Week reporter. He's going to um, talk about his book, uh, which paints a little different picture than a lot of people uh, perceive of the, the growing Chinese economy today. So a lot of interesting programs coming up. I hope, you'll, I hope you've enjoyed today's program. And we'll hope that uh, we'll see you on some future programs. So again, Spencer, Cameron, thanks very much for putting this together. Yeah, thank you. And if anyone wants to follow up with us, I'm happy to chat afterwards. Um, I can put my email in the chat box if anyone wants to have a follow up conversation, or I can put up on the screen either way. Connect with us on LinkedIn if you like as well. So yeah. we post a lot of our work there. Okay, great. Thanks everyone, and enjoy your evening. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Great program. Oh, good. Thanks, Karen. Glad you Thanks, enjoyed Karen. it. Thanks. <laughs>